Okay, so um, yes, Travel said I'm a PhD student at the University of Bristol. I'm in my third year. Um, my now that it's March, my funding actually officially runs out in a year's time. So I'm in that kind of final crunch period. Um, and today I'm going to be talking about um, exploring excellent atmospheres with both Hubble and JWST and moving into the IR um, and what um, these telescopes can tell us about excellent atmospheres. So I have a, a whole ton of collaborators for this work, some of which are listed on the screen, um, others of which are involved um, in these programs. Um, and I'll shout out a couple key people um, as I go through. So uh, just to start, a little bit of a roadmap for this talk. So I'm going to start by just doing an introduction to atmospheres, just so we're all kind of on the same page and we sort of know what we're looking at when we're talking about an atmosphere. Then I'll talk about the kind of things we used to be able to achieve in the past or kind of pre the JWST era, focusing mostly on um, a planet was 17b. Then I'll look at um, the kind of new dawn of JWST era um, transiting exoplanet observations through a planet um, WASP 39b. And then finally, we'll kind of take a turn and look at what is there still left to do? What holes do we still have? And what information do we still need? So to start off with, as hopefully we all know, there are lots and lots of planets. And many of these planets don't really look like the ones that we see in the solar system. So we have our kind of hot Jupiters, the big puffy things, which um, are really good for atmospheric characterization because they've got these big inflated atmospheres. And we've got our mini Neptunes, super Earth, this kind of class of planets that we don't have anything similar in the solar system. And so for all of these kind of weird and wonderful planets that we can't explain perhaps where they came from or how they formed, one way to solve those questions might be through studying their atmospheres. And personally, the way that I find most intriguing for studying atmospheres is through transmission spectroscopy. So in transmission spectroscopy, we observe a planet as it's transiting, as it's passing in front of its host star, and that causes a dip in the flux that we see. And we can characterize that through the transit depth, the amount of kind of dip, the amount of flux that we're not seeing due to that transit. If you observe the transit through multiple wavelengths, you can see that the transit depth is slightly different at these different wavelengths. And then if we build up um, all of the wavelengths of light that we're interested in through spectroscopy, we can build up what's called the transmission spectrum. And this allows us to study the different features within the atmosphere. So molecular absorption, atomic absorption, scattering, all that kind of thing. And at this point in time, enough exoplanets have been studied that we can start to kind of compare them a bit more holistically as kind of a whole population and look at the things that are common throughout their atmospheres, some things that are a little different. So one of the first things that jumps out at you is the sort of double humped feature that you see in the near infrared, which is really easily accessible with Hubble's um, wide field camera three. And this is due to absorption of water. We also see that we get these um, atomic absorption features in the optical, which you can get fairly easily um, with the STIS instrument on Hubble from sodium and potassium. Sometimes we get these really flat spectra, which we typically attribute to the presence of clouds. And sometimes we get these kind of really steep slopes in the optical re region, which typically are thought to be due to aerosol scattering. Oh, uh, oh, I need to admit someone to the waiting room, but I can't see the mouse. <laughs> on the troll us that way. Uh, I don't know why it's not. Oh, whoops. Let's see. Right, I'm going to pop out for a second. <laughs> and admit Neil. Neil, you're making me angry. I'm sure. Yeah, let me go and ask somebody else who can. <laughs> okay. So, picture of all of the kind of things we might expect to see in an atmosphere. So, hopefully, now we're sort of at least all in a fairly level plane field as to what at least a transmission spectrum looks like and the kind of things we might expect to see. So let's start by talking about the Hubble observations of a planet um, that hopefully should give you an idea of what we've typically been able to do pre jwst So if we take a look at this figure again, which is from Singadol 2016, what they did um, in their kind of 
grouping of these planets is they decided to rank them from what they perceived to be the clearest planets at the top to the cloudiest atmospheres at the bottom based on the amplitude of that water absorption feature. And all of these planets are very interesting. They have great signals. They've all been studied um, pretty extensively in their own right. There have been papers published on each of them up until recently, all except for one, which was WASP-17b. So uh, WASP-17, which was discovered in 2009, pretty typical hot Jupiter, it's got an equilibrium temperature of about um, 1770 Kelvin. And it was included in that Singadol study as being the clearest atmosphere that they found. However, the original HST observations only captured half of the transit which means that the resulting signals we got weren't as good as they could have been. And so the comprehensive analysis was never published. Um, this planet has kind of remained in a bit of a limbo for quite some time, but it's going to be a cycle one JWST target. And so it's really important that we have a good understanding of what might be going on in this atmosphere, what's happening with the existing data so we can kind of model everything for JWST as efficiently as possible. Okay, so the um, first project um, that I did as part of my PhD was to um, analyze some newly obtained near infrared data to reanalyze the original optical and infrared data that was included in that past study, and then to provide a really comprehensive analysis of everything that we had on this planet. So we start off with our Hubble observations. Once we've cleaned everything up and extracted our stellar spectra, we get something that looks like this. We then want to bin our stellar spectra um, through wavelength, kind of avoiding those bin edges falling on any strong spectral features. And so if you extend that across the entire wavelength range, that looks something like this here for the G141 um, GRISM on Y4 camera three. And then if you look at, um, if you plot up kind of time going down the Y axis across wavelength, you can see that when you normalize your flux, you get this nice kind of dark region where your transit is happening, um, surrounded by some slightly lighter regions where you've got um, all of the flux. And so we can see here, great, nice transit centered in the middle of our observation, everything looks good. And we can do the same again for um, G102, which is just another one of the um, grisms available for us on WIPC3, it all looks good. Now, if we compare that to the original STIS observations for this planet, we get something that looks like this. So you can see we've got some nice spectra, but instead what's happening is while we're going into that dark region, we're never popping back out the other side. And that's because due to some issues with understanding what the period of this planet was, the observations were mistimed. And so we kind of missed that post-transit baseline that's really key. So once we have um, our light curves, we sum up all the flux either across the whole of the wavelength range or within one of those bins, we get our light curve out through time. But you can see here that these look pretty gnarly. We don't want to just try and fit a model to this straight away. We need to account for the systematic effects that HST has. So things like thermal breathing as it's passing um, in and out of the sun's light, kind of expanding and contracting as it heats up. We have these visit long slopes that last for the entire observation. And we get these sort of ramp and hook like shapes too. But we're able to characterize these types of things um, through a whole host of packages that we've developed um, at Bristol, um, which we call um, exotic, which is the exoplanet uh, time series characterization, we normally peg on toolkit at the end or whatever the particular package is. So if we take a look at the white light curves, this is all the flux across all the wavelength range. You can see that for our two near infrared observations, you've got the raw um, light curve at the top there, and then the corrected light curve underneath and our residuals. And so you can see that this now looks much nicer. We can do the same for the STIS observations on the top right-hand corner. And you can see again, we were missing that post-transit baseline, which is really key in helping to us characterize our exact kind of error and our uncertainty on the transit depth. And then down in the bottom right, we've also got um, two transits with Spitzer in the two um, IRAC channels. So we fit our HST data using exotic ISM which is an instrument systematic homogenization package um, developed by Hannah Wakeford. 
And then the Spitzer light curves were fit following the methods of May and Stevens in 2020. And that work was done by Erin May, who is at John Hopkins APL. We then want to fit our spectroscopic light curves. So here, each one of these light curves corresponds to one of the wavelength fins that you saw before. And each of these light curves is going to have a unique transit depth. And then each of those transit depths becomes one transmission spectrum data point. So if you kind of smush all of this together into one plot, what you get is your transmission spectrum. So we've got our STIS observations in the kind of optical through to the near infrared where we've got WIPC3 and then Spitzer photometry out in the infrared. If we add in a flat line just to help guide the eye, what can we immediately tell just straight away just by looking at this? We see we've got that nice double humped water absorption feature and we can pretty confidently say that's likely due to water. We see we've also got a bit of a slope in the optical. The spectrum's not just completely flat. That's probably due to some kind of scattering, but we can't really say for certain right now. And then that second Spitzer point is a little bit higher than the first. So maybe that's evidence of CO2, but we can't say any of these things for certain by just looking at the spectrum. We need to do some modeling. And what we do here is we run atmospheric retrievals. So this involves running atmospheric models, varying our input parameters based on the fit of the models to obtain posterior distributions. So we can kind of get best fit values and uncertainties of things like the temperature of the atmosphere, abundances of different gases. You can sort of see a live cartoon version of that happening in the bottom right corner. Atmospheric retrievals can, however, be very computation expensive depending on the complexity of the model that you start with. We can either run a free chemistry retrieval in which all of the abundances within the model are free to vary as wildly as they like to, or we can have an equilibrium chemistry retrieval, in which case everything has to follow the chemical equations, the true physics that's happening within the atmosphere to as much as we know it. So we used Poseidon, which is a 2D model with free chemistry developed by Ryan McDonald, who is a postdoc at the University of Michigan. And we compared those results to um, that of Atmo, which is a 1D model under chemical equilibrium, and those were run by David Singh. So we had, um, in practice for WAS-17, what this looks like was kind of developing this huge suite of retrievals, varying the different molecules we were throwing into the model, um, checking, do we need the presence of a cloud deck? Does that improve the state of the model? We found that it did. Did we need some scattering? We found that we do. Was the presence of stellar activity important? Not really for this planet, we can probably rule it out due to past observations of the host star. But what we did find is that, um, well, we needed some evidence of kind of some combination of H minus TIO, VO, that seemed to be important. But as you can see here, we ran over 20 models for this one planet, which is a little absurd when retrievals should help you prevent kind of doing these huge sweeps of forward models. And the reason was that as we were doing our retrievals, we found that seemingly at random, some of the um, posteriors for our molecules were coming out rather than these nice, well-constrained Gaussian shapes, were coming out completely bimodal. So here we've got um, the abundance posterior for H2O, and we've got this equally likely high metallicity peak, and an equally likely low metallicity peak with that sort of valley in the middle. The model has no idea how to um, fit to one value, and it's sort of you get this double peak structure looking like the eye of Sauron should be staring down in the middle and everything's a bit of a nightmare and we can't say anything about these models, right? So what we figured, okay, we have a big suite of models. What if we plotted up all of these abundance posteriors? Maybe that will key us into something. And so what you find is that all of our models vary from being well-constrained, low metallicities. Then you get this mess in the middle where nothing is constrained. And then again, we also have some models which are well constrained but have high metallicities. This was not immediately clear what was going on. So we figured let's plot out the best fitting model in each of those scenarios. So that pink, green, and purple, uh, pink, green, and blue models that you can see here. If we plot them up, maybe when we see the transmission spectra, that'll something will pop out and we'll understand what's going on. So we tried doing that. Oh, and I can't move the box, so bear with. Um, <laughs> I think I'll have to escape again and then just like minimize. 
Okay, so we plot up all of our models. And what we find is that, well, that really wasn't that helpful. All the models kind of look identical. There's a little bit of difference towards the um, infrared, but we can't say a lot about what's happening there because we don't really have any data. And they've all got nice fits to the H2O. But if we take a look at what's happening in the optical, the quality of the optical data is just so poor that the models are able to throw just about any combination of molecules in there and quite happily fit through any bumps and wiggles they think they find. And so that's why we're getting this kind of like anything could be fitting this atmosphere scenario. The optical data just isn't quite good enough. But what we are able to say is that we can constrain the presence of water absorption. We know there's definitely H2O in this atmosphere at seven sigma. And we can sort of tentatively say that there's probably CO2 at around three sigma. Um, but as you'll find out later on, that number is now sort of laughable in the era of JWST. So what is it that was 17 b can tell us? We're able to detect H2O and maybe CO2. It's really essential to use statistical evidence and our understanding of the physical processes in the atmosphere when we're interpreting our spectra. It's not enough to just say, this model has the best chi squared and I'm done. And we need to use really high quality optical observations in combination with the infrared if we want to get a complete understanding of the chemical inventory of the planet. So that was where we were at kind of a year ago before we had JWST. But what's happening now? What, 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 what's changed in the past year? I've been part of the JWST Transiting Exoplanet Community Early Release Science Program, which aims to provide the community with publicly available transit data sets and analysis toolkits and kind of best practices. And what do we think the best um, precisions we can achieve with JWST is as soon as possible after the launch, as soon as we could, so that the community could be prepared for cycle two and for analyzing their own data. And primarily I've been um, in the panchromatic transmission working group. And here our aim is to look at one target, WASP-39b, which is a hot Jupiter, a little bit colder than WASP-17b, and look at um, four different observation modes, near SOS, near CAM, and two different modes on near spec, PRISM and G395H, and build up this really comprehensive transmission spectrum from about 0.6 to about five microns. And I'm primarily going to talk about the G395H observations uh, because I actually led that paper. So near spec consists of two detectors, um, NRS1 and NRS2. And while the prism spectra, which are nice and short, fit really nicely within, within NRS1, the G395H spectra fall across both detectors. And we lose a little bit of information in the middle there. And the reason this is happening is because the prism spectra are nice and short, that's low resolution. Whereas the G395H spectra, they're high resolution, so they're much, much longer. And the traces are also slightly curved, which is another thing we have to think about dealing with. So JWST observations, if you're not familiar, have a slightly strange um, structure, which can be a little confusing if you've never used them before. One observation is typically known as an exposure. Then each time series data point is an integration. So say if you have 100 integrations, that's 100 data points on your light curve. And then within each integration, we have multiple groups, which are are consecutive non-destructive reads of the detector. So the transit happened on the 30th of July last summer. And we had 87 groups per integration and 374 integrations in total. So that's 374 points on our light curve. So the aim of the group within our kind of G395H team, we wanted to use lots and lots of different pipelines so we could compare the impacts of using the default calibration pipeline versus using different custom sets, different ideas that people had about how they might want to analyze the data themselves. And we immediately found that the instrument throughput was much higher than we expected. So we created some custom throughputs, which you can see um, the red lines in the top plots there using um, the exotic limb darkening package, which was developed by David Grant, who's a postdoc um, at Bristol. And you can also see a nice example of the spectral traces there on NRS1 and NRS2. Um, just bearing in mind that these have been kind of compacted a little bit because while they're 32 pixels high, they should be um, 2,000 pixels long. So normally it just kind of looks like a squiggle, basically. 
my work um, was developing this pipeline, uh, which I named Exotic Jedi, um, Jedi standing for JWST Extraction and Diagnostic Investigator, definitely a backwards acronym there. I came up with Jedi as a word beginning with J. Um, and so the aim here is that it, we can go from the rawest uncalibrated FITS files all the way through to transmission spectra. So I'm replacing and flagging any bad pixels, removing one of the F noise, producing any parameters that we might want for detrending, like X and Y pixel shifts, or the full width half maximum for stellar trace. And then ramp fitting, extracting the stellar spectra, producing light curves, fitting light curves, all the way until we have our nice observation of the atmosphere. But I mentioned one of the F noise there. What on earth is that? One of the F noise arises because detectors don't read every single pixel at once. They follow this pixel by pixel readout pattern. And so we read one pixel and then it might take 10 microseconds before we can read the next one and so on and so on and so on. And then we, when we get to perhaps the end of a row or the end of a column, it takes a little bit of time before we jump to the next row or column. Now detectors also have kind of their own inherent noise from their electronics. And that tends to get read out and convoluted in with the astrophysical signal that we want to observe. So pixels that are read out near each other, so kind of one after another, will have fairly similar noise properties because there's been a short amount of time between when they were read out. So there's this one over F or one over frequency dependence. And since near spec reads out column by column, this manifests itself as sort of vertical stripes that we see in our images. And you can see an example of that um, at the top there. It sort of looks like this like tigery pattern. And so we need to be de-striping our images to reduce the noise as much as possible. Ideally, we found it's important to do this at the group level, so as early on as you possibly can. But it's also fine to leave it until the integrations if for some reason perhaps you haven't got enough groups and you're adding an additional noise by trying to do it too soon. We also saw in our WASP-39 observations this mirror tilt event. So this happens when one of the segments on JWST has this sort of spontaneous and abrupt change in its position. It sort of pings into a different place. And you can see that in the difference in wavefront um, taken sort of just before the observations and a couple of days after in this image here from um, Evelyn Schwawen. And you can actually see that in the light curve. So in our broadband light curves here, there's this jump in flux right in the middle of the transit, and that corresponds with when that mirror tilt event happens. And these events cause a change in the PSF, which is why the flux is changing. And so we can actually track this through, for example, the uh, four with half maximum of the spectral trace, which you can see in the top right hand corner. And there's actually a wavelength dependent change in that um, four with half maximum, as there is in the flux. And we also see a noticeable jump in the Y pixel position of the trace. I say noticeable, it's about 1% of a pixel, but that is something that we can trace um, and can be really helpful as a detrending parameter. So all of this information is really good to kind of feed into our light curve fitting later on. So now we have our light curves. These obviously look much, much nicer than what you get raw out of um, HST. We've not done anything to them here. This is literally just plotting up what we get straight out of the pipeline. And so we can see the first 10 integrations show a very slight settling ramp, about 600 seconds there where you've sort of got this ticking on almost before it flattens off. And there's a very slight linear slope across the entire observation on NRS1. Although I should note that other observations which have happened more recently, um, particularly observing brighter targets, seem to show a slightly stronger trend than that. But otherwise, certainly compa compared to what we see for HSD, there's very little impact from systematic effects, which um, is nice to know. It's, it's, it's nice to have these really gorgeous clean light curves almost straight away that don't need too much doing to them. So as part of the G395H team, we produced 11 different transmission spectral analysis using different combinations of um, cleaning processes, different people's pipelines. So we've got Jedi there, which is the pipeline I developed, Tiberius, which is developed by Jay Adams and James Kirk, uh, Transit Spectroscopy, which is developed by Nesta Espinoza, and Eureka, which has been a community-led project. We also have different fitting processes. Some people used um, least squares minimizers, some people used um, Gaussian processes, some people used MCMCs, and we also had a whole different um, approaches to the limb darkening. 
Some people fitted for their parameters, some people held them fixed. People use different versions of um, the various laws that are, that are available to describe the limb darkening. And so really, we kind of covered every idea under the sun here as to how perhaps you might approach fitting a JWST light curve and producing a transmission spectrum. The aim of sort of seeing, does any of this have an impact in what we get out the other side? And the answer is not really. We get these really nice consistent transmission spectra across a whole host of different techniques. And you can see the weighted average there is plotted in black. So what again can we see straight away? We have some H2O absorption um, towards the slightly bluer infrared wavelengths. This kind of sloping shape here is because of H2O. We've got this giant hump in the middle, um, which we attribute to CO2. And then there's a little bit of structure um, out towards the more infrared wavelengths. That's probably because of some CO. But there's also this weird bump here at around 4.1, 4.24 4 microns that we really weren't expecting to see. And actually, if we take a step back now and look at all of the observations that were part of this program, you can see that um, the prism spectrum, for example, which has the same wavelengths as G395H, also sees that bump around four microns. And they were able to um, ascertain that that was likely due to sulfur dioxide. And you can also look at the um, near cam observations, which cover pretty much the same wavelengths as um, NRS1 for G395H, and they get that very similar shape um, in their water absorption feature. And then uh, nearest, which we don't really have any overlap with, um, sort of matches. You can see how those two stick onto each other quite nicely. So if we take a look at our molecular features in a little bit more detail, we can see that um, that CO2 absorption, here we've got some best fit models and we're just taking out one of the molecules, for example, the CO2, and just comparing the fit of the, our model um, with everything in it, and then the fit of the model taking out one of the molecules. So for example, for CO2, you've got that um, orange line, yellow line that gets left behind. So we've suddenly now with JWST, we've gone from a three sigma detection with Spitzer to a nearly 30 sigma detection with JWST, which is kind of insane. And similarly for H2O, we're now at a 20 sigma detection. And then for that SO2 feature, we're around 4.8 sigma. So how is that? SO2 there, we didn't expect to be seeing it. But what we find is that when we run some of our model fits with and without that SO2, we get an, we get a improved reduced chi-squared and that we need a volume mixing ratio of about 10 to the minus six to fit that um, spectral feature that we're seeing, which corresponds to about five ppm of SO2. And what's happening here is that coupled photochemistry of H2S and H2O within the atmosphere kind of breaking things down and producing the, requi the required amounts of SO2 that we're seeing. And this is the first evidence of um, photochemistry within an exoplanet atmosphere. And you can read more about the photochemistry um, in a paper that just got accepted a couple of days ago. But we also saw this evidence of maybe another mystery feature um, around 4.55 microns. And you can see this kind of weird pickup sort of triangle shape in the spectrum. And various people were looking at the spectrum and saying, hey, what the hell's happening there? That looks a little bit weird. And so we took a look at our original stellar spectra and we thought, you know, can we clean these down a little bit? Maybe we missed out a cosmic ray, maybe something's happening there, but that wasn't it. And besides this feature covers about a hundred pixels on the detector, which is a very large amount of pixels for there to be some kind of detector effect. And then we thought, okay, what if we try and we flatten out the spectrum and fit a Gaussian to that shape. Maybe it's just a trick of the eye and something about the slope is making you think there's a shape there. But no, there's definitely a bump in the spectrum there at about three sigma. So we tried fitting a whole host of different molecules to that shape, different isotopologues of molecules, trying to see if we could match the absorption feature that we see. And its narrowness suggests that it might be like a very distinct Q branch. But in that case, we can't find um, any molecule that would have such a narrow spectral feature but wouldn't have other continuum shapes that might, for example, be blocking the SO2 feature. So we really have absolutely no idea what this thing is. I should note that many species lack um, really complete and accurate high temperature line lists. In fact, many species don't have any high temperature line lists whatsoever. So this really isn't an exhaustive search, 
but it just goes to show that actually there are many things we're going to see with JWST that we aren't going to have the answers to just as quickly as we had that SO2. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. So um, are you able to kind of pin down pressure levels for some of these in terms of like a model? Uh, because I know Peter had that sulfur chemistry kind of um, paper and you talked a lot about kind of punching and like the altitude of this. So I wonder if you might have seen something weird at a weird altitude that is also undergoing this equilibrium chemistry or something like that. Yeah, I mean, it's possible that, um, yeah, there's some kind of combination of chemistry that's like maybe there are multiple features that are like on top of each other that we haven't noticed because so the modeling that we did for this and I'll talk about this in a second the modeling for this planet for this paper um, was very very simplistic and so we never kind of got into any of this like disequilibrium chemistry or anything like that other than for the photochemistry of the SO2 feature so yeah there's a lot more work to be done just on this spectrum alone um, but from a kind of quick here's a huge kind of list of spectral features just throw it at the shape and see if it matches. Nothing popped out immediately, but potentially, yeah, there's, there's, we had an idea a couple of days ago, could it be a haze thing? And we tried and it was not quite the right wavelength, but um, yeah, still definitely an ongoing piece of work. So let's get on to interpreting the spectrum and fitting some models. So here we've just got um, some really simple forward models in which case you just kind of run them ahead of time based on um, kind of different uh, metallicities, temperatures, kind of a grid of models, and then you just shift them up and down to see where they best match. So nothing too complicated here, and all assuming equilibrium chemistry. What we're able to say is that the atmosphere is enriched in heavy elements at around three to 10 times solar metallicity, and that the C to O ratio ranges from sort of solar to subsolar, and we're able to put on an upper limit of um, a C2 ratio at least less than one, which implies formation likely happened maybe around the snow lines, and then we had migration inwards to the current position, or perhaps there was late stage accretion of heavy elements, and that's why the planet looks the way it does today. But I should say all of this is just with some very basic modeling, um, and there will be some more detailed retrievals coming hopefully within the next couple of months. So what is it that WASP-39b can tell us? Well, we know that G395H is obtaining really high quality light curves with fairly limited impact from systematic effects. We have unlocked access to a whole host of carbon and oxygen bearing molecules with the ability to assess some others that didn't feature in this work. And we can even um, explore the presence of photochemistry as well. And for this planet, we see that the C to O ratio and the metallicity imply that the atmosphere is enriched in those heavy elements. And so this work was part of a really, really huge team. Um, all of the co-authors on the paper um, are listed down below. So definitely not um, a, a sole effort on my behalf. Um, and there are probably many people who you recognize within this author list. So we've talked about JWST and where we are now and kind of this new dawn for exoplanet atmospheres. But as I've kind of alluded to in the talk, there's still some work to be done. If we jump back to WAS-17b, as I keep saying, that existing optical data really just isn't good enough for the retrieval analysis to help us understand exactly what's happening within the atmosphere. Well, we are at least going to be getting JWST GTO observations um, in the infrared. So we're going to be combining nearest SOS, near spec G395H, and MIRI LRF to get from about 0.6 to 12, depending on your opinion of how good Miri is, microns, to kind of get this really comprehensive coverage of the infrared. But that doesn't help us with the better UV optical observations. But actually, HST with C3 has this untapped UV optical mode. So the UV is GTA, G2 AT rhythm, which covers from about 2.8 to 0.8, 0.2 to 0.8 microns, does so at higher throughputs than STIS in that similar wavelength range. And while analysis can be quite tricky, so we've got these kind of nearest soft style curved traces, we get much higher precisions and we get much more efficient observations than we could with STIS. So for example, you might need three transits with STIS to get comparable coverage um, in wavelength range that you can get with G280. And the real power of this grism is that we're sensitive to disequilibrium processes and aerosol scattering, and we're probing these really low pressures within the atmosphere 
getting access to kind of unique species that we don't normally get to see. And we've seen through previous observations that a single transit of UVIS, for example, um, in the case of HAT P41B, which is in the purple at the bottom, and WASP-178B in the orange, are able to match or even better the, the combination of five transits that we used to observe WASP-121B in the green. And actually, um, I'm part of the Hustle program, which is the Hubble UV Optical Survey of Transiting Legacy Exoplanets, which is PI'd by Hannah Wakeford. And we're going to look at 14 different exoplanets across temperature and mass space, aiming to kind of constrain particle sizes and mixing and all of these kind of mid to near UV absorbers. And you can see, for example, here, um, what we have simulated, what we expect to get out of UVs in the black, compared to what we currently have um, from STIS, in this case for WAS-17b. And you can really see how we're getting more wavelengths and at much better precisions than we could do with that STIS data. And so if we put it all together, we're going to have a complete transmission spectrum of WAS-17b from about 0.2 out to 15, maybe 12, depending on your opinions of MIRI microns. And we're also going to have complete emission spectra, so the thermal emission of this planet, from 0.6 to, again, sort of 15 microns. Um, I haven't even touched on emission in this talk um, up until this point. And so WAS-17b is going to be really one of the most comprehensively studied exoplanets that we have um, as of right now. So it's a really exciting time uh, to have this as one of your favorite exoplanets. So what are some key takeaways um, that I've gone through in this talk? I've mentioned how it's really essential to use statistical evidence in combination with our understanding of the physics when we're interpreting the spectra. We need high quality multi-wavelength observations, both the UV, optical, and infrared, if we want to understand the complete chemical inventory of the planet. We've seen that UVIS is helping to unlock some of the bluest wavelengths the first time with its high throughput and broad coverage for efficient observations we get these kind of disequilibrium processes and aerosol scattering at a new level than we've had before. And G395H, which in my opinion is the best opportunity to explore the IR, we get really high quality light curves with fairly limited impact from systematics. And we have access to a whole host of those really important carbon and oxygen bearing species. And we can even probe photochemistry in some cases. So with that, I'm happy to take all and any questions that you might have. I have more questions. I'm going to shut up. So, uh, <laughs> I'm going to let y'all scale it here. Uh, yeah, you might want to speak. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, Prabal asks anyone online, feel free to uh, ask questions. I think uh, I might have to escape, but I, then I can see the chat. Maybe. <laughs> 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 30 slide. <laughs> Let's see what we got. Yeah. So if we have anybody in the chat. So cool. All right. So if anybody has questions, I will shut up first because I'm <laughs> always talking. So and then if anybody has questions here, I'll just go first. I'm going to start. <laughs> yeah. All right, so um did you I'm excited about UV stuff, I'm sure. Yeah. Um so in terms of the position you get, do you think if you expect to see, because I get excited about ozone, sulfur products, a lot of things that actually might be relevant to some of the infrared things we have too. Do you think you have a precision for that on certain size planets? Um, yeah, the UV is a little tricky um, because you're very dependent on like your host star. So yeah. some of them are really, your kind of intuition doesn't quite match what you would expect for like kind of the G1 for one type planet. So some things that you think are really great typically aren't as good for UVs because the host stars just like aren't particularly bright in that wavelength range. Um, but yeah, for some of the, um, you know, the really good candidates, particularly the ones that I think are already being observed, the kind of low hanging fruit, for example, basically if the cross section is in the right place and the mechanism is there for it being in the atmosphere, there's no reason why we shouldn't see it. It's just, you know, predicting which planets do you think you're gonna see the right things in, which is, you know, if, if we knew how to do that, then it would be much easier planning observations and things. All right, so then I should have a quick question, and this would be uh, hopefully only to the time here, but you have UV now and you have a bunch of infrared channels. You, can, you don't have to worry about stars anymore, right? That's <laughs> 
So yeah, stars, the question is, do we now have everything solved because we have all the wavelengths and so we don't need to worry about stars anymore. In a wonderful world, yes, we have all the wavelengths and we don't have to worry about stars anymore. But of course, you know, we can still, spot crossings can still happen. We can work as hard as we can to have ground-based monitoring of these planets. Um, ideally, if, if we know a priori that a star is um, particularly active, then um, contemporaneous observations can be very helpful, um, particularly in the UV. Um, I believe it is plausible. <laughs> well, yes, whether they will let you do it is another question. Um, yeah, I mean, if I had the keys to the world and I could point all the telescopes at the same thing at the same time, that would be great. But um, <laughs> yeah, and yeah, and ideally, you know, for some targets, that really is the only option, particularly with Hubble when you've got. So one of the pitfalls of UVIS, because it's Hubble, you do miss every 45 minutes. And so if, for example, you've got like an end off that's flaring, then that can be problematic if you know, it flares when you're not looking at it. You know, how do you know that the next um, kind of orbit of Hubble data hasn't been affected um, by that flare? Um, especially because of sort of the quality of the Hubble data comes down raw, you can't always immediately tell. Okay, this orbit looks like it's a funky shape. Is that just because it's Hubble, or is that because the star was doing something weird and that funky shape is actually real? And so we've seen, for example, with observations of like AU MIC, which is famously a very active flaring star. Um, uh, Hubble can be extremely challenging because you just don't have a good kind of long-term baseline of what the star is doing. No, uh, <laughs> so for the gene, I'm totally stolen a lot of data about conversions of the gene and I age. Um, is there overlap in their end over? Not really. Um, they kind of end at the same spot um yeah i have kind of david grant who's um who kind of does the miri side at bristol um the two of us have long kind of anguished over the fact that there's like not at least one micron of overlap because there's really interesting stuff at like four microns and there's really interesting stuff at eight microns and you can't do them at the same time and it's really annoying um yeah you kind of maybe you get three or four data points overlapping, but the um, the throughput of GPU95H of that part is just not ideal. Um, if I scroll, yeah. yeah, you can see like around here, the throughput is getting a bit, eh, and the spectral features aren't that strong there anyway. And so it can be quite hard to kind of match the two up together. You should get like a sulfur product there. You're gonna have sulfur flowing all the time now. Which can kind of yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and again, you know, if, if you equally, if you've got mirror observations that are starting to saturate, the first thing that will go will be that part where they link up to the G395H. So, yeah, it would be really nice if we had just like 0.5 more microns, but that's fine. <laughs> you might not be able to hear me, but. Um... Do you have questions that come to your head later? Uh, I guess the moment is happy to take those. Yeah, yeah. Any any further questions? More than happy to take them on an email or anything like that. Yeah, always happy to respond. I have a question about um, exotic exoticism. <laughs> That's the one that you use for public. Yes. And that's public, right? Yeah, yeah. So does it do both with C3 and CIS? Um, so um, where, where is my slide? There we go. Yeah, so actually everything on Exotic is public. Um, so Jedi is in an extremely beta version. Um, and um, the limb darkening package has actually been adopted by Eureka. And so they now work together. Um, but yeah, so the, the Hubble package, um, the Wolf C3 version um, was like very nicely coded up um, by, I forget her name now, but um, a, an intern that Hannah had at one point in time um, and runs really beautifully and really quickly. Um, and the STIS version exists in, in Hannah land, in whatever, in IDL, I think. And so it is not ready for public consumption, but it has been a long, long-term goal to get it out there. 
Um, but yeah, so the idea of that package is you just kind of have your grid of all the possible systematic models and combinations that you think could be happening and you just marginalize over the whole thing and then out pops your best model for that scenario, essentially. And what about you, Viz? Do you plan to include that in any of the pipeline? Yep, yep. So part of the um, part of the hustle program, which is this slide, um, part of the, because it's treasury program, part of the aim is to not only just to produce this kind of all these really wonderful data sets, but also because, you know, the UVIS Grism was just sort of left languishing for such a long time is to develop these tools that people can use because you know, it is a little bit trickier than um, WIFC3. I think for a long time, you know, people were able to just kind of take their WIFC3 data and everyone under the sun has their own package that does WIFC3. Um, but yeah, part of this program is going to be to produce um, pipelines that will work. Um, we actually have Michael Radica from um, University of Montreal, who's currently visiting at Bristol, who's working on some UVIS data and some pipelines for that. Um, and so, yes, eventually down the line, I think something will come out, um, but as, as happens with these things, uh, goals never quite match up with when packages actually appear. So we shall see.